Welcome to Divine Mercy Matters. In this episode, we will cover the Feast of Divine Mercy, as explained by some of the experts from the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception and our partners in this important ministry. As official promoters of the Divine Mercy message since 1941, we are pleased to offer you these teachings that will help you to grow in your faith. Now let us begin. Well, in the first place, uh, where did this whole idea of mercy, Feast of Mercy come from? Uh, very early in the piece, it was on February 22nd, 1931, that Jesus appeared to Faustina and gave her a commission. Paint an image according to the pattern you see. And when she went to her confessor, telling her about this, he said, yeah, go ahead, paint the image of Jesus in your soul. Um, well, that's not the way she understood it. As she came out of the confessional, she heard the words of Jesus in her soul. Um, let's get the words. My image already is in your soul. I desire that they, there be a feast of mercy. I want this image, which you will paint with a brush, to be solemnly blessed on the first Sunday after Easter. That Sunday is to be the feast of mercy. It's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, so that's the very origin that we know about uh, what our Lord asked, that an image be blessed, venerated, and that the priest preach on uh, God's mercy. That's feasting on mercy, to know the pardon and the love that God has in store for us. Hallelujah. And Hallelujah. that He wants us to hear it at that time because He sees it as an enticement, especially for sinners, to decide to come back to Him and take advantage of His mercy. But uh, in, on June 7th, 1997, the Holy Father paid a special visit to the shrine of the Divine Mercy in Krakow, Poland, and he prayed at the tomb of Blessed Faustina for the first time after the, um, her beatification, which he performed himself. And it was there that he gave these startling words for some. I give thanks to Divine Providence that I have been enabled to contribute personally to the fulfillment of Christ's will through the institution of the Feast of Divine Mercy. Uh, the Lord gives us these words. My daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the Feast of Mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls and especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. And he explains what that fount is. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. As I look at the 20th century, which is the century that just ended, there were two great messages from heaven the divine mercy of Jesus, infinite mercy. You know, even St. Faustina, I've been reading her diary for a year, two, two and a half years now. And she, and Jesus, she describes it as her, the mercy of Jesus is infinite. It goes beyond anything we could even possibly imagine. That's why there's no sin too great for God's mercy. He came to forgive those sins. That's why he took a, a body from the Virgin Mary in the book of, you know, the he, letter to the Hebrews. It said, coming into the world, I said, you know, sacrifice and oblation, the, you know, the temple sacrifices, burnt animals and all of that. You didn't want, but you gave me a body. He took that body from the Virgin Mary so that he would become the victim. He would give himself, you know, and he did on that cross, huh? right? Father, and when he said those beautiful words, it is accomplished. What was accomplished by Jesus? Two things, it's like two sides of the same coin. What was accomplished was the Father's will. He always did the will of his heavenly Father. And also what was accomplished was our salvation. And that's why he died for us. You know, and he, uh, you know, he's always ready to grant us the grace of mercy that he won for us by 
his suffering and death on the cross. It's this mercy that gives us hope. Jesus, I trust in you. You know, if you're being tried by all kinds of confusion, things going wrong, make a great act of trust in his mercy. And uh, especially for your sins being forgiven. I just did a show yesterday, I filmed the show on scrupulosity. Poor scrupulous people repeat their sins over and over. You know, they think, well, maybe God didn't forgive me. There's no sin God won't forgive. There's no room for us to ever despair of God's mercy. Huh? And that's the, so very, very important. You know, one, and um, scrupulous people tend to con confess their sins over and over again. You know, Padre Pio, there was a lady came to him in confession, and she always <laughs> repeated her sins over again. He says, well, the next time you do that, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> well, you know what happened? She went to confession to another priest. She confessed all her sins over and over again. She came out and she felt a slap on her face. It was probably Padre Pio. God doesn't want us to doubt his mercy. It's the most neglected sacrament. People are not going to confession. And here is the great peace. The peace that St. Paul said, it goes beyond all human understanding. I go to confession every week. I have, a, I have a confessor. He comes to see me. We go to confession to each other. But I go every single week. And you know what? What I feel after that confession, the mercy of God, he lifts all my burdens, all my worries, all my fears, whatever it may be. And I feel like, okay, it's time to begin again. And someone once said, saints were nothing but sinners who kept trying. I am convinced that divine mercy is what makes joy possible. And joy is the one thing that is the most indispensable key to unlock our life mysteries, our struggles, our challenges. But even more, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And as Pope Francis recently reminded us, evangelization in our time will only take place as the result of contagious joy. What was that document called? Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. You can tell whether or not you're really understanding divine mercy. You're really receiving it. You're really grasping it. You can tell whether it's gripping you by whether or not you have joy. Joy is the supernatural and the natural result of opening ourselves to receive the grace of divine mercy. And as Pope Francis reminds us, it is the key to the new evangelization. Why? Because most people are never going to reach the point where they can explain every doctrine or prove it all from the Bible or defend the faith by clearing away every single possible objection. But what all of us can do and what all of us are called to do is simply enjoy being Catholic. That is the single, that is the single most effective way to evangelize our friends and our family members, our co-workers and everybody else. And why? Because the world offers countless pleasures, but not one single lasting joy. And yet it is the one thing Jesus gives us even in the midst of hardship and sorrow. And sometimes especially through hardship and sorrow. Joy is what we all want. Joy is what we all need. With it, we can stand up to any challenge, any difficulty. Without it, we will cave in under any pressure, and we will go along with the world. Jesus didn't simply bear the cross for us. He bestows a cross on us. But before he took up his own cross, he instituted the Eucharist. Before he bestows crosses upon us, he gives us the Holy Eucharist so that when we receive the power and the love and the mercy of the crucified and resurrected, the ascended and enthroned Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, because that's what the Eucharist is, that's who we receive, we get the power to do what we could never do on our own. We get the power to do what only Christ could do on his own. He didn't do it instead of us, he did it not as a substitute, but as a representative. Not so that we wouldn't have to, but so that finally now at long last we can and we shall because he loves us. Pope Benedict said divine mercy is not a secondary devotion, but an integral part of Christian life and prayer. 
Now, let's get into this. When is the Feast of Divine Mercy? Most everybody knows, right? It's the second Sunday of Easter. It's the Sunday after Easter, right? So you have Easter Sunday. And the following Sunday, Jesus said to St. Faustina, that has to be the day. That date is the Feast of Divine Mercy. Now, what is it then? Is it, I said earlier, is it optional, is it not? But you know, in our Roman Missal, in the English, it's mistranslated. The Latin word seau in the Roman Missal is translated as or. So our priests open up the Missal and it says the second Sunday of Easter or Divine Mercy Sunday. Now that sounds optional, doesn't it? I want an apple or an orange. But wait a minute, what's parked out in that parking lot? Is that a car or an automobile? You see, the translation correctly, according to Dr. Robert Stackpole, is really namely, or that is. So it should say the second Sunday of Easter, namely Divine Mercy Sunday. Or the second Sunday of Easter, that is the Divine Mercy Sunday, right? First of all, we know in our faith that we need confession for the forgiveness of sins. But when you go into the confessional and you confess your sins, as long as you have a valid confession, right? You confess all the grave sins you can remember. You have some form of contrition. You're, you're somewhat sorry, right? You have to be sorry. And you do your satisfaction, your penance. You have a valid confession. However, when you come out of confession, what about the punishment? Does any punishment remain on your soul? The answer, yes or no. It's actually both. I know that's an answer that nobody likes, but when you come out of the confessional, the eternal punishment due to sin, in other words, facing the fires of hell, that's gone. That's wiped away, as long as you have a valid confession. But the temporal punishment due to sin still may remain, unless you are so contrite, unless you are so sorry that you're on your hands and knees. Lord, I am so sorry. I will never do this again. Or you have perfect purity of intention in prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Unless you do that, if you're like me, you probably still got some temporal punishment remaining. And that can be really tough, right? So our Lord says this is an opportunity to be cleansed of that, okay? To be, walk away from that, right? Now, what do we do? We come forward, we come out of the confessional, we're forgiven of the sin, but that punishment still remains. And it's so funny because this grace of Divine Mercy Sunday wipes all that away. Now, some who really know their faith have come up to me and said, okay, Father Chris, but this is just a plenary indulgence. First of all, let's look at what a plenary indulgence is. A plenary indulgence can be one of many things we do to receive the grace of the remission of temporal punishment due to sin. For instance, I'll give you just an example, four examples. There's many, there's hundreds. But one is you can walk the stations of the cross any day of the year, not just during Lent. That's a plenary indulgence. Two, you can pray a half an hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament, reposed or in the tabernacle. And that is also a plenary indulgence. Praying the rosary inside a church, chapel, or with another person or group of people is one as well. And then finally, a half an hour of scripture. If you read a half an hour of scripture, which you can do in your own home, you also too can get a plenary indulgence. However, in order to get it, there are four conditions that apply. So not only do you have to do the indulgence act, but on the same day, the first condition is you must receive Holy Communion, right? Second, you must have been to confession within now, the church used to say eight days, but since the Jubilee year of 2000, the church now says about 20 days. They want to give you a little bit of flexibility there so you're not calling your priest at 11.59 on the night of the eighth day, right? And saying, I got to get confession or I don't get this plenary indulgence. So they say about 20 days. That's the second condition. The third condition is that you pray for the intentions of the Holy Father. And we can do that mainly through an Our Father or Hail, Hail Mary and a Glory Be. But it's the fourth condition that sinks most all of us. And that is we can have no attachment to sin, even venial. Now, if you're like me, you're still gluttonous at the dinner table. If you're like me, 
you're still impatient waiting in line. If you're like me, you probably say things you shouldn't when that driver cuts you off on the road. So you see, I still have struggles, many of us still do. So if that's the case, our indulgence isn't plenary, it becomes partial. But this is okay, because pennies equal dollars. Partial indulgences add up. You should keep doing them. But yet, we still don't really always get to that highest point of a full plenary indulgence. The complete forgiveness of sin and punishment due to sin. This is a grace given by Christ on Divine Mercy Sunday. And so while the plenary indulgence true can be offered up for yourself or a holy soul, the grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is only for yourself. But there's a plenary indulgence also offered on Divine Mercy Sunday. So it's great you can receive the extraordinary promise for yourself, but offer up the plenary indulgence for a holy soul. It's a beautiful day of grace. So the difference, in, in essence, is the plenary indulgence is given by the church, right? The grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, given by God himself through revelation. Private, but revelation. The indulgence is removal of punishment for sins confessed, Divine Mercy Sunday grace is the removal of all sins and punishment, even the sins forgotten to be confessed, right? The indulgence, you need no attachment to sin. The grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, anybody can get out of the gutter, go to Holy Communion, and receive this grace. We've, we've mentioned about this image, all the beauty of the faith, the Holy Thursday, the Lamb of God. The Good Friday, the hands and feet in the side of the crucifixion and the risen Lord. It's basically Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter morning wrapped up in a single image. And when we say the chaplet, Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity. That's what we believe as Catholics in the real presence. We're offering to the Father a Eucharistic prayer. You know, in the early church, the Eucharist was called the great secret. It's a secret that's not supposed to be a secret. I'll tell you one story before I get into more on the dying talk here, but in 1996, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, a lady told the priest that after Mass was over, there was a defiled host on the floor in the back, and he went in the back and saw it and picked up this dirty host. He didn't want to consume it, so he decided to put it in a chalice and put water in it and thought it would dissolve. Well, he went back about eight days later to look at this host, and it hadn't dissolved. It had congealed, and there was blood, and it was almost like tissue. So he told his cardinal, Jorge Bergoglio, he said, keep it a strict secret. Let's observe it. And then let's photograph. And as time went on, the tissue congealed and got larger and larger. He said, I want it investigated. So they called a very well-known scientist from Bolivia who had worked with a Nobel Prize laureate. He was an avowed atheist. And he had set out to disprove faith that science has an answer for everything. So he took it to a laboratory in New York, of all places. They didn't tell him what the tissue was. The pathologists were amazed. They said, well, first of all, this is human tissue. Secondly, it's human heart tissue. And thirdly, what's very puzzling is because was the person alive at the time you took this biopsy? Because this tissue came from a live person. And, uh, and number four, whoever this came from, by the inflammation in the, in the cardiac tissue, this person suffered great trauma. The great secret. You know, the number one Christian faith is Catholicism. And the number two Christian faith is fallen away Catholics? How could anyone leave the church if they had a clue about the real presence?
How many of you remember your first communion? I remember mine. It's a small farm town in Ohio. I remember the singing. I had a little nice white shirt on and dress pants. When we receive Holy Communion, we are to receive as if it were our first Holy Communion. But we're also to receive as if it were our last. Because we don't know it could well be. I used to give these great lectures, I thought, to my kids, and I realized as they're now older that most of the time it just went in one ear and out the next. But people do look at you and they see how you live and lead your life. And they see the peace you have in your heart. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. And even if you walk through the valley of death and there's fire all around you, just know that He's with you and He loves you more than you can ever imagine. Each one of you are like a diamond in the rough. Jesus said, Mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to My mercy. That's the antidote to today's problems. Pray, hope, and don't worry. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you will help us in our ministry by accepting St. John Paul II's challenge to be apostles of divine mercy and share the wisdom that you have received from this episode. Please come back and view our next episode and avail yourself of all our support products that will help you to better understand and grow in divine mercy. May the merciful Savior bless you and keep you in His loving hands.